Good news, hey? I didn't really know 
where to start about who to look for for that type of training, so I jumped in and did it myself. Then once the dog understood it, his name was Justice, by the way, hence the name. Uh, once the dog understood it, I then got him certified. Uh, started getting real, real serious about it in 2020, but as you see here, we specialize in basic obedience, advanced obedience, behavior modifications, tracking, trailing. We do a little bit of service dog work, um, but what I've been seeing a lot of lately is reactivity, uh, nervous, anxious dogs that uh, want to fight people or other dogs. I deal with a lot of that, so. Next. Um, this is kind of our, our motto to our clients. Uh, we want to make sure that every dog owner that comes to us has a better understanding of how the dog thinks, operates. Nothing makes us happier than seeing an owner and their dog grow a strong bond. The bond you build with training is unbelievable. It is our job to educate you and mentor you along the way. You're not just a client to us. We genuinely build a bond with you and your dog that we can only hope would last, last a lifetime. So Madison Bell was established in 2015 when I left uh, law enforcement and we started working with um, a lot of uh, service dogs or veterans that were in the Army face. Uh, we kept getting a lot of requests for protection dogs and the problem we solved with a lot of those was the dogs were genetically bred for protection. So we started working with Joe Shepherd specifically for that and then we started getting a lot of reactive rattle dogs and then get guidance through protection and then it just established. So we always maintenance and keep up with all our protection clients and our baby clients as well. Not all the dogs that come to us, we also train in We train um few clients. Say that again? A little louder. Uh, we train any breed, um, but you mainly see pointy ear dogs on our website because a lot of those dogs have a long documentation history of training with us through protection and obedience. So we grab what we can and put on our website. Next. So we are a balanced dog training service that utilizes training technicians to develop dogs mentally and physically. Um, my name is Brandon Lipsy. I am an advanced obedience trainer and I've been training dogs for like about 10 years. Uh, I am currently in college for computer engineering. That's a, about it. Um, my mom, Anna Carter, she's in the crowd somewhere. Uh, she's an advanced media trainer and she was a former financial manager for large financial institutions. For, yeah. And um, my dad, Rodriguez Carter, he was a prize, prior U.S. Marine Corps veteran and a prior federal law enforcement officer. He worked with uh, many federal working dogs uh, in his career, like he said, as a police officer. <laughs> All right, so what we're gonna talk about now is crates and why they are important. How many of you out here use a crate at home? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Very good, awesome, all right. All right, so as you can see here, crates, uh, they can be used as a safe space. Safe spaces are important because they can make your dog feel secure, allow them to de-stress, and give them a place to be alone. So Rodriguez, do you wanna piggyback off of some of that and uh, so some examples? So one of the things is, it's green, it's all. Push it. I didn't push it. Oh. There you go. So one of the things about crates is that any dog that is not crate trained, you're gonna see a lot of bad behaviors, right? If you have a dog that runs into their crate and waits for you to come close it or opens it itself like Sage was doing backstage and goes inside the crate. You typically don't see a lot of issues when it comes to behavior work. Most of the dogs said that's where separation anxiety starts is in the crate because we put the dog in there because you know we don't have time to deal with it right now and they're going through something and and then we just exacerbate that situation. So normally if you can get a puppy crate trained by the time they're at least 16 weeks old you're not going to have any issues with separation anxiety and things like that. Just to piggyback off of a little bit of the crate stuff is <clears throat> the longevity of how long your dog is in a crate does not matter the same way that we think it does to a dog. 
So dogs, their t the way they perceive time is not the same as ours. So many, 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 many people, when I talk to you in an evaluation, go, you want me to leave my dog in a crate for 12 hours? Well, if you work a 12 hour shift and you have an hour commute to work and an hour commute home, no, I want your dog in there for 14 hours. When you get home, your first responsibility is to pay attention to your dog or your children or whatever else that you have responsibility for. When I get home, I work two hour, or I work two jobs. I work 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week, depending on the way my work schedule plans out. And I also have children. So when I get home after 12 hours a day, my first responsibility is to meet the needs of my two dogs. I have two of them. So one of them gets at least an hour of my time. The other one gets at least an hour. And then I can start doing all my motherly and wifely duties. So when my dogs go into their crate in the morning time, they've already been in their crate all night. They go out to go to the bathroom. We have a quick play session, maximizing how awesome it is to be out of the crate. And then when they go back into the crate, we have a routine. As soon as they know I'm ready for work, both of them go to their crates and wait for me to shut the door. It's a part of their pattern and dogs run off patterns. So it's second nature to them. They know that they can take a nap, eat and drink and do whatever they want to do for the rest of the day until I get home. And then they know that when I walk in, it's play time. They get to do the best thing in the world and that's play with mom and do their job that we talked a little bit about earlier. So when your dog starts picking up on these patterns, 14 hours to a dog might be what feels like four hours to us because a lot of it, they're just sleeping. Dogs actually need upwards to about 12 hours of sleep broken up into different naps throughout the day. Your dogs don't sleep all night while you're asleep. Sometimes they're just laying there waiting for you to wake up because they don't know it's three o'clock in the morning. So when I, everything that you know about time, when it comes to your dog, your dog doesn't. So when we talk about this stuff and you're like, my dog's gonna be in a crate for 10 hours. It's not chewing stuff and dying while you're at work either. So those are things to be mindful of as we go through these things is time and how long they're in there is not the same as ours. Y'all got anything to add to that? Like she said, um, the crates are very useful. Uh, one, to help protect the dog from getting into your stuff um, while you're away at work for 14 hours. Our courts. May I ask a question? Oh. Yeah. Yes. So how long do you think the dog should stay in the crate? Is there certain age you take the dog out of the crate or if it's a permanent thing? So that's a good question. I think that's based on your lifestyle. Absolutely. So if and, and the person you are. I mean, I typically I don't want my dog with me, my puppy with me 24 seven. I have to create some distance because if I'm not, I'm telling my puppy that we're never gonna be separated. And the minute we are, I'm gonna have separation anxiety. So I wanna have my puppy to understand that I can put them up and I can go do stuff and then I can come back and get them, but I don't wanna have them in there for 12 hours. Okay, so does it have to be a crate or could be just a room with a gate on it or? It would be a crate. And that would it be considered be a, a crate. Dead. Yeah, that would be considered a dead. Why do you think it should be a crate instead of an open, closed-in room? Because it's boundaries. And then, and the, and the puppy or dog that's in there, they can't go and get into something, right? Or, and when we talk about these things being things that they can get into, we hear all the horror stories at Canine Justice. I'm sure you guys do too. Um, big, 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 big vet bills of, hey, my dog had a power cord and now has wire in their stomach. It's not just for us to shoo away our dog and say, hey, if you're in a crate, you're in this cage because you're being bad. Dogs don't perceive it that way unless you make it that way. Yeah. So when your dog, you wouldn't leave your house and leave your toddler in the living room and say, all right, I'll see you in a couple hours and just let your toddler get into stuff because they would get hurt. Dogs have a very toddler mindset, especially for about the first two years of their life. If they're not being occupied and something isn't piquing their interest, they will find something to pique their interest. So whether that be chewing on power cords because it feels good or whatever, um, eating grapes that you had on the table because you got a fruit basket, grapes will kill a dog. 
you'll come home and you'll either have a really big vet bill or you'll have a dead dog. And I mean, I hate to be that extreme about it, but it is extreme. So the same as you would put a toddler in a pin, like a pack and play or a crib is the exact same way I want you to think about a crate. It's for safety purposes and dogs need boundaries because like Rodrigo said, if your dog is constantly attached to you the minute that you want to go on vacation and we board your dog, your dog is a mess, an absolute panic attack. And it takes a lot of work to stop separation anxiety and a lot of money out of your pocket later because it's really tough to deal with. So one, one example I can give you, uh, we got a mountain dog come into the facility and the dog started hacking a little bit and then it, there was some vomit, excuse me for eating, I'm sorry. Um, but there was a pencil grip there, right? A uh, couple of seconds went by, the dog does the same thing, same thing happens and this time it's a sock about this long that comes out of this dog. That sock could have easily killed that dog. Maybe. The owner had no idea. Um, so also going back to what she said, Whenever you're doing crate training, you're setting your dog up for success when it's time to go to a vet or go to a groomer. Um, because the dog, let's just face it, things happen and if the dog has to go have a surgery and it has to stay in a crate while it's at the vet, it's going to be there freaking out the whole time. Um, and then you're looking for trouble with your dog back home. So keep that in mind too. Yeah, I mean, if you take them to a uh, kennel facility, they're going to kick you out. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to see you home and that's going to mess up your vacation. Or they're going to say, hey, Next time your dog stays here, it's going to be really expensive because your dog messed up my crates. Yeah. So it's not just for us. It's definitely for the dog, too. Is there another slime crater? No, no. Okay, so another thing on crates I want to talk about is that when you put your dog in a crate, that you have to condition that. And everything with a dog, if it is a small thing for us, it is a very, very big thing for your dog. So you don't just slam your puppy into a crate and go, you stay. That's going to make a negative um, experience for your dog. So we have, I know we have a video posted on how to condition dog crates on YouTube. You guys might. Um, first, you start out with just baby steps, just having the crate in the same room as your dog. And this doesn't just apply to puppies. This applies to grown dogs, too. Um, being... The dog moving around the uh, crate, knowing how the crate sounds, knowing how the, the crate opens around the dog. These are all things that need to be introduced to the dog before you ever just slam your dog away into the crate. You also want to use, when we talked about earlier, about what makes the dog excited and what's a good reward for the dog. Use that to your advantage and say, hey, when you even touch this crate, you get to get paid with hot dog, bull, chicken, whatever. Um, training treats that you want to use and when you step your foot inside you get paid for it whenever and you don't leave the doors you leave the doors open don't shut the doors on the dog and just stay there now you're going to progressively go through this your dog's going to get super comfortable and go hey every time I get near this crate mom or dad doesn't just lock the doors and walk away from me because you don't want that to be the image that your dog has of every time I get put in this crate mom and dad leaves for a few hours you want to, at first, when you get through all the conditioning of it, put your dog in there for 10, 15 minutes. Come back, good dog, go play. And then make that a little bit longer every single time. That way your dog knows, hey, every time I go in here, I get to come out eventually. And it's not always going to be four hours, 12 hours, or whatever. As Making your dog as comfortable in there as possible is just like making your kid very comfortable in their bedroom. If you allow them to stay out of it a lot and stay with you constantly, it's like kicking a toddler out of your bed, which is the most terrible thing to try and do for parents who know. If you automatically start them in their room and in their own crib and not away from, or and completely away from you, you don't ever have to transition later and deal with all the temperament and the crying that you're going to deal with later. So if you can think about dogs the same way that you think about kids, it gives us a better idea of how dogs think and the psychology behind, well, if I took my five-year-old out of my bed at five years old, I have to reverse back five years of me sleeping next to my child. Same with a dog. If you put your dog in a crate and your dog's five years old, it's going to take some time. It's not going to work overnight. But if you start when they're little, you get them used to it, that becomes their space. And you don't get to go into their space, that's where they feel comfortable. 
And just in my household, if I even raise my voice, both of my dogs go to their safe spots, the doors will be wide open, and they're like, it's not us, it's the kid. So that's where they feel the most safe. So that's the, the end goal to everything that I just said, is how safe does your dog feel in their safe spot? Some dogs, you might not be able to ever take them out of their crate. Some dogs do great with freedom, other dogs don't. So if you say, hey, my dog's four years old and it's been in a crate forever, and then I'm gonna try and leave my dog out and something gets tore up, too much freedom for that specific dog. Um, like she was saying, to have a good, uh, good emotion towards the crate, you can try uh, feeding them inside their crate yeah. or putting toys in them in there for them to play with. Uh, just have them enjoy their time in the crate so that they don't have any negative emotions towards it. So make everything like a game. I mean, you saw the canine handler. And one of the things that he was talking about was the pitch of his tone of his voice. If I have a crate with puppies, I'm throwing the treats in there, we're playing, they're playing inside the crate, and then they associate the crate with a good thing. So then when you open the crate, they run into it. But if you put them in there when they're being bad, they know that, and they don't want to go in there. You're gonna have a crate issue. Does anybody have any questions about crates? My dog can find where Starting with commands like no, wait, and off. 
like he was saying with the toy, you can try and teach, uh, leave it. That's another command you can use to train zombies. Um, I don't know, another example like uh, food on the counter, you can, you can use the no command. I would do most of the boundary training, like how he explained your toy example. Um, like for the table food, you can do the same thing with, I, I don't know, like um, a, a big reward like a chicken and throw it on the ground and have them leave it, not go towards it. And then when they are calm about it, you can reward them from a treat from your hand or the treat back. Um, yeah, so boundaries go, you, you have a good idea of what boundaries are here with the no, the off, the wait. Uh, you go towards the doorway before dog goes. But boundaries also goes into uh, having a structure with your dog too. You have to set in a structure and you have to have boundaries with that dog. Um, it doesn't go so much as to being an alpha or being dominant over the dog as much as it is being a good leader. So you're leading this dog through life. You have a dog that doesn't know anything at all and we bring this dog into our home which genetically this dog gives, you know, down the genetic line, these were wild animals. Now we have a dog in our home that we're wanting to live like humans. So we're gonna have to teach it from the ground up. Everything that it does, it learns from us, whether it be bad or good. So setting up structures and boundaries is gonna help you a lot uh, as the dog ages, as far as going back to the no jumping on people, counter surfing, um, pulling really hard on the leash, darting out of doorways, stuff of that nature. And you can really test your dog's boundary because you know how your dog reacts when the doorbell rings. So that's where they start. Everything is almost like Pablo's law with the ringing and the salivation of the dog. Everything starts there. So if the dog's erratic, jumping on people after the doorbell, then that's it's gonna trickle into every aspect of the dog's life. So touching back on that law you just spoke about, explain to them what that is. So Pablo's law was a Russian um, was a scientist or psychologist, whatever. Yep. And he took this bell and he would have this bell ring and every time the bell would ring, the food would drop and the dog would see it and go get the food. But certainly they would start ringing the bell and waiting for the second, mm -hmm. roughly two seconds. Roughly two seconds and the dog would start to salivate before the food even came. So it was showing the dog to be conditioned to noise, the sounds, the visual markers come in, but she's gonna talk about later. Next. <coughs> Before we jump into this, anybody got any questions about boundaries and structure? Dogs are very structured animals anyways in the wild. <clears throat> Their whole packs are built on structure. So when we're correcting our dogs, we should never feel bad, especially if you correct your children. And some people correct their children much harsher than they correct their dogs. And I don't know how we got there, but we need to go back because at the end of the day, dogs are dogs. And as much as we love them, they have to be corrected or they turn into dangerous little war missiles. No matter how small they are, the, I get bit by more small dogs than I ever do big dogs. So that just tells you that lack of boundaries and structure for a small dog matters too. And if you don't catch boundaries in the beginning of owning your dog, your dog will control your life. And at some point, your whole life will be wrapped around your dog's bad behavior. And that's also very expensive to fix. So something to keep in mind. I actually had a dog. I'm gonna tell the story and I'll let them finish. This lady came in and I felt so bad for her when she was trying to do her evaluation with me, which lasts roughly an hour. This dog kept jumping on top of our counter and licking her constantly. As fast as you can imagine a dog licking, it was all over her, climbing her back, licking all over her arms, her neck. And this dog was being super bratty and pushy because the dog wanted to leave. The dog was ready to leave and she wasn't because she was trying to get some good information from me. I finally took the dog from her and sat on the leash and just gave her a break because I could see that this woman almost wanted to cry. She was desperate and I felt for her because she was just covered in drool. It took, it took every bit of four weeks, every single day, at least four hours a day, of me for the first two weeks being licked to death for me to set this boundary of like hey if you want to hang out with me you've got to not touch me 
because that's pushy behavior because I'm not petting you and I'm not giving you my undivided attention. You're being pushy until I finally put my hand on you and say stop. Me putting my hand on that dog enabled that dog to continue to do what she was doing because even me just putting my hand on her and saying stop, she said, that means I'm being great. That's almost like a pet and I'll take it because any kind of me being interested in her, even if it's bad, even if I'm scolding her, she was like, that's something and I'll take it. So when we tell our dogs, when we try to calm our dogs down in public and go, hey, 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 it's okay. We're enabling our dogs. It might as well be a yes marker and we'll talk about that in a second. But we need to be very careful about us trying to say, hey, stop, or putting our hands on our dogs because that can mess up your boundary and your structure training really, really fast. So this slide kind of goes over that too, structure patterns and consistency. These are dog training essentials. These ideas are so important, you need them even when you aren't training. Taking your dogs out and feeding them are some examples. And what this means is even when you're not training, stay consistent with what you're doing. Because again, dogs learn off of patterns. When our pattern changes with that dog, they become confused. Then you start getting bad behaviors. Then you become frustrated because you're like, you were just doing this, what's going on? And all you have to do is take a step back and look and say, man, I fed at a totally different time than I'm usually feeding. Or we went out with potty at a totally different time. So now it's late time to them. In your mind, it's potty time. Right? So take your dogs out and be consistent with when you take them out, feeding, have a set schedule when you feed. Uh, it goes back to the crate thing too. Once you, you know, I see a lot that um, will ask clients about using the crate. Everything's good through the week, and then the weekend's terrible. Well, that's because your dog doesn't realize it's the weekend. You do, and because you're at home with your dog, the dog's out of the crate all weekend long. Now you're starting all back over Monday. So even I'm not saying keep your dog in the crate all weekend by no means, but there needs to still be crate time implemented throughout. Uh, because you're breaking that pattern on Friday because we're off work and we're having a good time We want the dog to be there with us. But in reality, what's going on in that dog's mind, it's confused. It's like, hey, this, this is a free day. I'm going to do what I want. And we become frustrated again. Um, so just remember, patterns are very, very important in the way that you do things with those patterns. And every single person in the house should be on the same page. What can you do? Like, uh, I work 12-hour rotating shifts. I work uh, like seven days on eight to eight a day and then seven nights eight to eight. Um, Is somebody at home with the dog? No. Nah. <laughs> That's a good question. What is it? Oh, here it is. So he works a road safety shift. Now, correct me, seven, what's right. the hours? Uh, it's 12 hour days, 12, 12 hour shifts, but I work seven nights and seven days in a period of 28 days. I work 14 days, I'm off 14 days. As long as when you are home for those 14 days, you know, they they're all together, you know, they're divided up. You know. Right. While you are still home, <clears throat> implement structure when you're home. So your dog has already got a pattern of what happens when you're not home, right? Well, it's a puppy. Okay, even better. You have a fresh, clean start. Yeah. So your dog is starting to pick up on patterns of when dad's not here, I'm gonna be in the crate. And when I, when dad is home, I still have to go to a crate and take a nap. And I'm really glad that you brought up a puppy because puppies do not have off switches. They're much like babies and toddlers. And if you don't let them go take a nap or suggest a nap, they will turn into the meanest little tiny gremlins you've ever seen. And that's when they start destroying things and they turn into Tasmanian devils. That's when you start to get a lot of bad behavior because they're tired. So usually when you start to see these bad behaviors, you got to ask yourself, how long has it been since my puppy's taken a nap? And if they just woke up, is my puppy bored? So to answer your question, on the days that you're off, I would start doing an hour out, play, eat, put the baby puppy to bed for a nap. Let them stay in there for at least an hour and take a nap. And you're gonna start teaching them, hey, when you go into the crate, it's time to chill. Yeah. When you come out, it's time to play. All right, next. So right here, do you have any questions on the previous slide and what we talked about? Any more questions? Do you 
know why she's jumping? She's happy to see. So dogs can only exert energy and excitement a couple ways. And usually when you leave it up to your dog to learn how, it's jumping. So they explode with excitement. And if you're able, I'll tell you how to fix it in just a second. If you're able, you're able to catch it before. Kind of what we were talking about this morning of dogs think in screenshots. If you can knock that thought out before you get to a level eight, let's pretend dogs are zero to 10. If you see them fixating on a three, you need to be at a four, make a correction, make distance, do what you need to do to put your dog back down to a zero or a one where you're tolerating good behavior. If your dog is already at an eight, you've missed a window, not paying attention, and some of us do, all of us do actually. We're all trainers here, and we're dog owners before we're trainers. My dogs get the last bit of training out of me at the end of the day, so my dogs are probably the most worst behaved dogs out of all the dogs I touch in a day. But if I'm going to fix jumping, I know what the trigger is, and that's people that she loves or new people. I'm going to put her on leash because the only way that I can make a correction is if she's attached to that leash. She doesn't care what I'm saying because that would be enabling her if I'm saying, hey, no, calm down. She doesn't care. All she hears is, I'm a great dog. Keep doing it. So taking all the verbal stuff out, you know somebody's coming over before they even come over. Say, hey, don't pay no attention to this dog at all. Don't look at her. Pretend she's not even here. Pretend she's just furniture. If she's not getting that reaction, because even when people are getting jumped up on, most of the time they go, oh, it's okay, it's okay. No, it's not okay. So, and they'll touch the dog and push the dog down, or they'll do this with the dog. That's all a behavior, or that's all rewarding bad behavior. So if you say, hey, look, we're still in training and we're working on this, pretend she doesn't exist, and you just pretend that this dog that's over here, you're gonna have her on leash, right? So she's gonna be over here not touching that person, not getting a reward and not getting paid attention to, which is what she, the reaction she wants is. Then you have the ability to correct her, put her into a sit, and just so everybody else knows, we conditioned Marie's dog with a prong collar or a pinch collar, depending on who you ask. I prefer to call it a prong. It's a Herm Springer collar that we gave away earlier. We'll have some more on the table out there. And that is a good way for her dog to understand correction. So when the, when the dog jumps up, you're able to make distance, get away from the exciting thing a little bit, make a correction and make your dog go into a sit. And once she's sitting, you can start rewarding that behavior. And what that tells your dog is, hey, I'm being really good and I'm getting paid for it because we call treats $100 bills. And if you're getting a random $100 bill, you're gonna keep doing whatever you're doing at your job. So what we're doing is saying, hey, you can't do that, but you can do this, and this is good. Then every time somebody comes over to your house, they'll ignore whoever that is completely because they'll be looking at you saying, where's my $100 bills? So it's all about conditioning, and it won't happen overnight because uh, Marie's dog is five years old, so she has five years to go back and correct bad behavior. Just like any kind of diet is, we didn't get this way overnight, it's not going to go away overnight. So that's how you fix that. And I hear dog jumping in almost every single evaluation that I do, and that's just because there's not a lot of good information out there to fix it.